Hello, and welcome to ADCES's podcast, The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team. In each episode, we speak with guests from across the diabetes care space to bring you perspectives, issues, and updates that elevate your role, inform your practice, and ignite your passion. I'm Kirsten Yale, Research Manager at the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. If you enjoy the huddle, please take a minute to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. Today, we continue our conversation with Dana Lewis, one of the creators and founders of the Open Source Artificial Pancreas System, also known as Open APS, and Daniel Ruck, Diabetes Nurse Practitioner and Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist, in our conversation about automated insulin delivery, how it started, the movement, and how to work with your clients interested in AID. Yeah, there's eight to 10,000 people worldwide right now using open source algorithms. And there's numerous studies showing the reduction in harm for people living with diabetes using these systems. And I think we can talk about this now because Dr. Hussein talked about ATTD. They announced they would be releasing an international consensus statement. And there's over 44 adult and pediatric endocrinologists on this study. Um, diabetes educators, nurses, and they included four legal experts to make sure they were kind of covering the full gamut and release that statement at some point. I don't think it's released yet, so I don't want to talk about details, but they did make an announcement that that's coming. Can you say anything about it without saying details? I can only announce kind of what they have because they were the main authors on the study, so I I don't want to talk too much more about it, but it's basically saying how to form that conversation around these systems and showing the safety for them and and the effectiveness of them on both highs and lows, of course. And there are consensus statements that already exist. For example, Australia is really well known for their diabetes organization of having a position statement on do-it-yourself technology. Mm -hmm. And it really comes down to recognizing that with all technology, there's risks and benefits, and it's really a person's choice and patient autonomy should be respected. And I think that is kind of the framework that a lot of these other country and international consensus statements have chosen to take a well, which I think is fantastic, is recognizing that patient choice and technology and what they use to manage their diabetes absolutely matters. I think it's also important to say that not everybody is going to want to use automated insulin delivery, and that's totally fine. But what I think and what has kind of driven a lot of my work, um, you know, as a community member, as an advocate, is we should have choice in the type of systems that we use. Automated insulin delivery systems did not exist until I created one. And I'm really proud that we now have the choice of multiple open source systems, as well as multiple commercial systems in some countries. But there's still many countries that don't have any systems approved commercially. And in some cases they're approved, but they're not covered by insurance. They're not affordable and accessible. So even though the technology exists and we're demonstrating safety and efficacy, we still have work to do to make sure that every person with diabetes has access to insulin as well as choice of technology, such as automated insulin delivery, if they so choose. Yeah, exactly. Just like with any implementation that we do in the clinic, there's going to be people who fit for this, people who don't. And um, that comes down to kind of clinical judgment and the person who is doing it, their choice as well and what they feel comfortable with. Yeah. One of the risks, though, that I see is mirroring things that have happened in the past with diabetes technology, such as standalone insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors. There's documented literature and evidence that in some cases, providers may choose not to even present options to patients because of perceptions around medical or technical literacy. And in some cases, those patients would be the ones who most benefit from an insulin pump or a CGM, for example, Um, struggling with fingerstick blood glucose test monitoring because of, you know, the rigidity and the lack of information you get from it doesn't mean that you wouldn't benefit or be willing to wear a CGM. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that the same patterns aren't recreated in automated insulin delivery. And I think we have work to do to think about how do we present technology that we know will benefit many, many people and think about things that we can do to compensate for the perceived lower literacy or lower experience with this technology, because there's a learning curve to all technology. Whether or not somebody is you know, really educated and has high literacy, everybody has a learning curve when they go from MDI to an insulin pump, 
or from finger stick blood glucose testing to a CGM. And the same thing with automated insulin delivery. You know, we need education, we need support. And I think we should be thinking about what types of education and support we provide, but making sure that this technology is available to anybody who wants to choose it and making sure that they know it's a choice for them and not taking that choice away from them by not introducing it as a possibility. I'm glad you started talking about access because I do know that technology in most states is available to people, but like you alluded to, the clinical bias to getting people on technology is evident. And there's been many studies that have shown that. So how do we increase access for people? How do we get over that therapeutic inertia of getting people to use this kind of technology? Yeah, I think that's hard sometimes. For the people who are going to be using the technology, with CGMs, we've been able to do trials, and so that's really helpful um, to kind of let people do, you know, a week or two with the CGMs. And um, there's not a real good representation of that for pumps right now. But I think getting people familiar with the technology, allowing them to see it, touch it, feel it in the clinic, see how it works, um, showing them videos of people using it, that sort of thing can really help. And then a lot of people are scared of it. They've never seen it before. It seems like this system that's just going to go on them and do everything for them. And they just, it's something that they just don't know. Mm -hmm. And so the more they can learn about it, the more they can see it, feel it, know about it in the clinic, I think is really important. And I think the same thing applies for providers too. When you started talking about people are scared of it, I've talked to a lot of providers, whether they're nurses, diabetes, clinical education specialists, or endocrinologists that just because of the lack of familiarity, they haven't yet had the opportunity to learn about it. Um, so again, that's one of the things that I'm angling at. I think this podcast is a great example. Hopefully some people listening to it um, have a better understanding of this technology and are willing to continue on in their learning journey. But I think making sure that clinical teams, you know, really understand the benefits of this technology and that we upfront talk about the limitations in the past of, you know, the kind of gatekeeping, so to speak, of technology and the biases and discrimination that happens as a result of that. And just bringing that to the forefront of the conversation, I think, is important. Just there's awareness that that's happening, that even there might be this unconscious bias happening, but we can address that by having the conversation and talking about the technology and making sure that they get the resources they need to be comfortable with the technology mm -hmm. so that in turn, they can present it to patients. And if those patients are scared or uncomfortable about that technology, that they too have the resources. I do have a couple more questions for you guys, but if I can go back almost to the very beginning um, and ask a really, really basic question, um, you know, the computer or the system that we're talking about, where does that sit? You mean physically? Mm -hmm. So for example, with OpenAPS, the algorithm sits on a small mini computer. I used to describe it as the size of a Tic Tac case, okay. but internationally people don't know what that is. So now I say <laughs> it's about the size of a AirPod or AirPod Pro case <laughs> right. for a physical comparison. They have actually made them that look exactly like AirPod cases <laughs> so that you can protect them. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> they fit in AirPod cases in some cases. Yeah. So it's this really small computer that fits in your pocket and it runs the algorithm and that also translates the radio commands between the pump, the CGM and the decision-making system that's held on that. Um, that's the open APS implementation in Loop, which is a different open source automated insulin delivery system. They have a mini computer of the same size that's just a radio bridge and the algorithm actually sits on an iOS device like an iPhone. And so the algorithm is on the phone and then the radio bridge communicates directly with the insulin pump. So there's different variations of does the algorithm sit on the radio bridge, the little computer, or does it sit on the phone, whether that's an iPhone or an Android phone, like an Android APS. Um, so that's the open source options. Mm -hmm. With a commercial system, some of them have the algorithm physically sitting on the pump, so there's not a separate device. And other systems are doing it through a secondary mobile device, maybe an Android device or a lockdown app uh, that communicates then with the pump and the CGM. Okay. And for clinicians that are interested or uh, diabetes care and education specialists that are interested in this, how do they learn or how, how do they get familiar with each of these different systems? And do they need to be familiar with all of them? And then they recommend to the people with diabetes that they work with? Or is it really something that you would ask the people with diabetes to do some research on and come to you? That is a great 
double question. <laughs> I'll start answering the first and then remind me of the second part of that if I don't get to it. And Daniel can chime in too. Um, there are tons of educational conferences and presentations that have been done at the formerly AADE conference many years ago. There have been every year, there's generally a presentation about the open source systems at the American Diabetes Association scientific sessions at the ESD or ATDD conference, like Daniel mentioned, there are scientific presentations, there's scientific literature that goes into the basics of open source automated instant delivery. This is a little bit of self-promotion, but I wrote a book. It is open source. It is free to read online or you can buy a copy, but it talks through the different technology. And if you only want to read one thing, there's one short chapter specifically focused for healthcare providers that talks about the technology and the learning curve and how patients might bring this technology in to them mm -hmm. um, and how they might want to respond to that. But then the broader book um, also addresses the differences in the systems and how it works. So there's videos, there's books, there's medical literature, and then there's a whole host of your peers outside in your social networks who have different levels of expertise and would be you know, happy to share. Daniel obviously is a great resource as somebody who uses it himself and has patients who uses it. So he'd probably be really good to talk about, you know, how do you respond to patients when they come in or do you recommend it and what does that look like? I think it's important for providers to know that there are different types of open source systems. Um, some may be familiar with one. I would say have a basic familiarity with all three, Open APS, Android APS, and Loop, because some patients may have an iPhone or an Android or certain pumps or certain CGMs that are compatible with one system or two systems, but not the other. Um, and so again, patient choice can really drive based on you know the phone you want to use, the pump and CGM you want to use, and also the algorithm. Because Open APS and Android APS use the Open APS algorithm, Loop uses a slightly different algorithm. Um, so different patients have different preferences there. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. The big conferences like ADA, ATTD, ADCES are all having speakers on this. Um, those are really good places to start. I agree. Dana, you have a TED Talk that I thought was really good. Um, it's from a while back, but I thought, you know, it's really popular. I think it explains it well. And then just online, if you want to look through the actual process that the person would go through to actually start looping or uh, start one of these systems, you can. Um, there's a GitHub for looping, I know, and you can just kind of Google that. Um, Dana, do you have a good way to verbally express how to get there on the, on the website? Yeah, you can go to openaps.org, and that links to the OpenAPS documentation. Loopdocs.org links to the loop documentation. Um, within the OpenAPS and Android APS documentation, there's actually a specific page that describes the algorithm and how the algorithm works specifically for a healthcare provider audience. So again, you can look at the patient information, you can look at every line of code if you want, but you can also look at the high level information that's written as a summary guidance for healthcare providers about each of the systems or about the technology overall. But basically there's a lot out there. If you can't find something, you are always welcome to email me and I'm happy to shoot you articles, links, et cetera. <laughs> um, so if you are interested, just feel free to reach out anytime to myself, probably Daniel and anybody else. You know, We're happy to point you to relevant resources or information, especially if you have specific questions about how a feature like auto sensitivity works or anything like that, we're happy to link you up to the right place. Yeah, agreed. Um, my Instagram handle is jdanruck, and then I'm also on Facebook, LinkedIn, of course. And my email is type1np at gmail.com. If you want to email me there, that's kind of my work email. Totally appreciate you guys giving us all these resources and they're definitely going to be in the show notes. So the people that are listening know you can go to the show notes and I can personally attest that both of you guys are always available and willing to ask questions. So please do ask questions, especially in this area. You know, I think maybe the only way to get the word out about this is to keep growing the network. But before we, you know, kind of get to wrapping up, I do have one more question for you guys. And it was really just listening early on, thinking about the noise getting rid of the noise and thinking about the quality of life of people with diabetes and how this technology really has the ability to make such an impact on quality of life. How does that impact habits and behaviors? Like what does that noise free up? Does that change the habits and behaviors that diabetes care and education specialists can work with their patients on? Oh, that's such a wonderful question. The answer is yes. Um, I, one of the things that I talk about as an analogy is that with manual insulin dosing, without this technology, people with diabetes can kind of learn habits and behaviors to get certain outcomes that are mostly okay. 
but it's like a house of cards where you kind of have these behaviors propped up on bad pump settings, for example, or things that only work because you're making decisions 10 times a day. But when you go into an automated insulin delivery system that's making hundreds of decisions a day and much smaller changes, you can more quickly see, oh, wow, your pump settings, your, your basal rates, your ISF, your carb ratio are not matching your current physiological reality. And you're much more able to, as a human, see that mismatch and be willing to use tools like AutoTune or make those adjustments on your own because you can see the before and after, the differences. Mm -hmm. And I think because so much of the noise is solved for, you have more mental energy and capacity to make changes like that. And then as the noise continually you know, gets taken care of, it's much easier to address things one at a time instead of feeling like you have a mountain of 20 things that are going wrong and you have to figure out how to change and get right. You can really narrow down to say, okay, what matters most to me is solving, you know, post meal excursions. And you can really focus on doing that. And so I think having the noise taken care of really helps the person with diabetes because it's easier to see what really matters to them and how to make those adjustments, but then also to work with a DCES who also has the data and can say, yeah, we really had the wrong settings here, Mm -hmm. um, but here's how we can change those settings and, and then see the before and the after. So I think it's a lot easier for people to experiment and make small changes and see the results versus before when we kind of changed 20 things all at once and it wasn't clear what worked and what didn't. And you had that house of cards that sort of worked, but it didn't work really, really well. Um, I think it's a lot easier to see that and to make changes. And it's less overwhelming because you can do it one at a time and see, you know, cause and effect or correlation of those changes in a way that you couldn't before. And so the feedback loop on those behavior changes is a lot more strong. And I think that helps us maintain or continue to do behavior changes if and when those are needed. Yeah. Yeah, completely agree. It's amazing how just muting out those day-to-day variability and insulin resistance can really help see where your settings are right, where your settings are wrong. And then like in the mornings, um, I drink coffee in the mornings, and it's almost like in a video game where you get a reset. Um, Every morning I'm waking up, you know, pretty consistently one 10s, 120s, kind of because that's where I have my settings set. I could be much more aggressive if I wanted to. But then I get to see, okay, I'm going to give 1.7 units for coffee this morning. And I get to see where that ends up four hours later. And then the next morning, I'm like, okay, well, that didn't work. I'm going to go 1.8 because I think I need a little bit more insulin. I can really focus in on fine tuning those things. And with a lot of the people I see in my clinic, It's just like with CGM, it's where the patient previously we had, you know, harped on people so much. Oh, you need to check your blood sugar because we need this data in order to make changes. But checking your blood sugar was so hard. And the same analogy applies here. Once they were able to get away from focusing so much on checking their blood sugar, and now they have a CGM and it automatically does it for them. Now we can actually focus on a lot more important, you know, where does this insulin need to go type of changes. Same thing happens with these systems. So now that I'm not focusing on the day-to-day variability of how insulin resistant I am or how, uh, how do you say it, like my, my exercise from yesterday is affecting me today, now we can actually focus on getting the settings right and trusting those settings. Um, and it really helps us focus in on the important parts. Mm -hmm. One other thing that I want to add about the potential of this technology is we've talked a lot about all of the things that a person with diabetes has to do Mm -hmm. in order to get outcomes. And a lot of the assumptions around what you had to do in terms of carb counting and meal announcement and bolusing or pre-bolusing and checking your blood sugar and keeping the systems running, some of those behaviors that we assume are fundamental to getting supposedly good clinical outcomes may change in the future. And Mm -hmm. we're seeing the potential of this with the open source automated insulin delivery systems. And I'm hoping for this in the second generation of commercial systems where these systems allow much more flexibility to the human and flexibility on a case-by-case, day-to-day, hourly basis so that the system can support if somebody wants to get really tight, ideal outcomes, 100% time and range, you know, picture perfect A1C of whatever that is for them, you can actually define what that is and have the behaviors that match that and really easily see what behaviors are required to get that outcome. 
But if somebody is okay with 90 to 95% time and range, and they want to choose occasionally to leave their system out of sight at the dinner table, maybe they're at a big business meeting or they're at prom and they don't want diabetes to be a part of the conversation, you know, these systems allow the flexibility to not announce or not bolus for meals in some cases. And yeah, you might go a little high and the system will bring you back down and it'll safeguard against lows. And the systems have the flexibility to support either all the time or occasional lack of meal announcement, lack of bolusing, and still get really reasonable outcomes that are on par with the first generation of commercial systems where you are having to do every single carb count and meal announcement and meal bolus and everything else. And so I think the future of this technology that will really be flexible on a case-by-case basis and allow people to choose, you know, and you will be able to see the cause and effect and the difference between doing these behaviors and getting this outcome but on a much shorter time scale than we ever had the feedback loop before. You know, it used to be you had three months of decisions and behaviors, and then you'd get your A1C. And that would tell you sort of how those behaviors all worked out. But with automated insulin delivery and the power of seeing this data, you can really see, okay, here's the difference between when I bolus for my meal and not. And when I announce my meal generally, or I do a really specific carb count. And in some cases, people may choose not to do some of these things that we formerly really wanted people to do because that's what it took to get decent outcomes. Now the technology is so powerful and flexible that it can achieve those outcomes without, you know, 95% of the work that we people with diabetes used to have to do. And I think that's really exciting. Yeah, you brought up a great point there that where these systems are now is where industry is going in the future. These automated meal uh, detection and boluses, pre-meal buttons, Uh, multiple exercise settings where you can, instead of just kind of setting it to target a blood sugar of 150, we can now target a blood sugar of 180 to 200. Or if you're lifting weights, you know, maybe go with 160, a little bit less, that sort of thing. And then auto-tune, all of these are coming to industry in the future. And you're exactly right about that feedback cycle is just happening so much quicker now because of these systems. I have to say you guys have completely inspired me, especially when I start thinking about data intelligence and really the game changer that that is. I think you guys mentioned that early on, that this is a game changer and it's really changing the quality of life for people with diabetes and it's empowering people with diabetes to live their lives the way they want to live their lives um, and opening up communication. I mean, that's another thing that data intelligence does is, a, you know, it's a bridge of communication. It's a bridge between our devices, but it's also a communication bridge between people with diabetes and their care providers. And I think it's really cool to see that it's a bridge of communication between you too, Dana, like Dana with your background in data science and your interest there. And then Daniel with your clinical work. I mean, just look at what you guys have been able to do, even just, you know, talking through things on this podcast with me and inspiring me. You know, I hate to do this. It's always at the end. I love these conversations I get to have with people. Favorite part of my job. But we have to wrap up. And I wanted to give you guys the opportunity for any, you know, just some final closing thoughts or crystal ball or words of wisdom you want to share with our listeners. Yeah, I'll go first. Um, Back when we were doing the pivotal trial for the closed loop system that I was on, we got to see a lot of what the computer was thinking and doing back then. And early on in the trial, some of our providers were kind of going into the system and changing what it was trying to do. And we actually got worse outcomes when we did that. And so that's what we're seeing is a lot of these systems really are allowing the system to take over and do a much better job because it's just constantly monitoring it. So the temptation sometimes is that that we're going to be better at this, but to let the system actually play out um, really does add some security in most cases. Um, a great example of this is, you know, I know, Dana, you probably hate this, but I'm going to give the Tesla example. But Tesla constantly monitoring decisions every, you know, one-tenth of a second versus somebody who's on their phone, maybe being distracted while they're driving, that sort of thing. But that kind of constant monitoring of driving and safety is just an added layer. And then it's not an either or debate, really. Uh, Just like with Tesla, it's not either the person's driving or the car's driving. It's okay, we have AI, and we're layering on top of that the human interaction with the AI. 
to keep it double safe. Um, and that's what we do with a lot of these systems is you have the AI or the automated system doing its thing. And then you've got the human kind of watching over it as well. And both of those things layered on top of each other, you know, create this extra ring of safety. Peter Thiel talks about this a lot, where AI right now means that the system's doing a ton of those small tasks that take up a lot of the bandwidth so that then the human can come in from some of those more important tasks. And when you layer the both of those, you get this net safety benefit. And I think the net risk safety analysis is the conversation we should be having about all automated insulin delivery technology systems whether it's open source or commercial, because the reality is when a person is diagnosed with insulin requiring diabetes or has diabetes that eventually requires insulin, they are given a vial of insulin that can both save their life, but also cause harm when given at the wrong time or in the wrong amount or just things change. And manually dosing insulin is dangerous, but we have to do it in order to stay alive. And so when we look at automated insulin delivery, yes, there is some risk added from all of these technologies, open source or commercial, but there's also significant risk reduction by adding the safety layer from these systems. And so you end up with net risk reduction with automated insulin delivery compared to manually dosing insulin. And that's a conversation I think we should be having. And a lot of the questions I think people ask about open source automated insulin delivery in terms of safety and efficacy are fabulous questions. And I want people to keep asking them. But I also want them to ask them about commercial automated insulin delivery. Because just because a system is regulatory approved or made by a commercial manufacturer doesn't mean that it's perfect and doesn't mean that it works for everybody. And so we as a community of people with diabetes and care providers can advocate for companies to provide more information about how systems work. Companies can keep their IP, but there is a way for them to better explain how the systems work so that care providers can better understand how to recommend and work with these systems with their patients and so that people with diabetes can better use these systems in the real world. And so I think the questions we asked about safety and how things work and what those safety layers are is something we should ask for all types of automated insulin delivery. So I'm optimistic about the future because we've shown what's possible in terms of technology, and it's exciting to see this technology become more available to more people around the world. So this is why I love talking with you guys, because you always make me think, and now I'm already coming up with another podcast for us, where we can, <laughs> where we can think about the AI and the humanistic pieces that Daniel talked about with that layer of patient safety and that risk reduction, you know, Dana, that you talked about, because it is so very important. But thank you both so much for being here. I've so enjoyed the conversation and I hope you guys come back again. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team. Today we heard from Dana Lewis, one of the creators and founders of the open source artificial pancreas system, and Daniel Ruck, diabetes nurse practitioner and certified diabetes care and education specialist on integrating automated insulin delivery into practice. We hope our conversation inspires you to think about new ways to work with your clients interested in trying automated insulin delivery. Membership at ADCES gives you access to the education, networking, and resources to improve your practice and optimize outcomes for your clients. Find out what ADCES can do for you at diabeteseducator.org forward slash join. The information in this podcast is for informational purposes only and may not be appropriate or applicable for your individual circumstances. This podcast does not provide medical or professional advice and is not a substitute for consultation with a healthcare professional. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions.